So about four floors, no, exactly, four floors above my office at Kaltura Tel Aviv sits a developer named Omri. He's a really fast typer. In fact, he's got one of those red backlit keyboards that are obnoxiously loud at that pace. Uh, when I commented on it, he, he and I actually took a, we raced in a typing speed test. Now, I won't tell you who won, but I will tell you that he's very good for an Israeli. He said, you came here to throw me under the bus, huh? I said, yeah, in the opening lines of my talk. Here's what else I found out. Omri, um, Omri doesn't like coffee, weirdly enough. He lately got into the OK Computer album by Radiohead. He's been listening to that a lot lately. When he's not in the office, he enjoys watching DIY science videos on YouTube, and more recently playing Red Dead Redemption 2, which he assured me that you all would know what it is. If you didn't, I looked it up. It's, an, it's a Western-themed action-adventure game. Apparently, everyone's been waiting for it. Omri is my JavaScript guru. Says it's his favorite language, and he much prefers client to backend. However, at Kaltura, he's actually a PHP developer. He uses our PHP client library to work on our Kaltura media space, which is our video sharing portal. It's, uh, it's like a private YouTube, basically. He says that he can't imagine working without the client library. Now, you want to know why I'm telling you all about Omri. You want me to get to my point, I assume. Well, here is your afternoon reminder of my four favorite words. Developers are people, too. They are fascinating people with favorite music albums and afternoon snacks and favorite video games, with opinions on coffee and keyboards and operating systems, with favorite programming languages and methodologies that come with those programming languages. There's this idea that nobody cares what developers think or say, we just care what they build. But that's not true. With more and more API as a product coming into the world, developers are the most important thing you have. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget to take care of them. And I'm here to remind you that if there are developers, we need to be taking very good care of them. My name is Avital Tsubeli, and today I'll be speaking to you about automating client library generation. Not for the fact itself, but as a very powerful tool for making the lives of our developers exponentially easier. We're talking about those developers working on our core products, our core features, the ones that we want staying loyal to our products and to our company. We're talking about the developers who are making our money. We'll talk about homemade solutions and generic solutions. We'll talk about how to do that in a way that is easy and feasible for your business, for your developers, because we all have other things to worry about. Now, Omri is not the only one at Kaltura using a client library. In fact, all of the developers working on one of our many products are using a client library. There is... Um, Iran, who sits at the, desk, at the desk right next to him, he's working on the Angular client library on the new KMC, Kaltura Management Console, that we designed to replace, this is the new one, that we designed to replace the old management console, which looked like this. And then there are those who are not even working on a product. There's my favorite team down the hall, the back-end developers. They're working on the batch client library while they wait for me to come back with croissants. Uh, what they do is write jobs with the various client libraries that are happening behind the scenes, things that take a while, like uh, ingestion or transcoding. They also monitor the testing library. And so at this point, you're probably wondering, or I hope you're wondering, because I'm about to tell you, how we ended up with so many client libraries. I have to cover a little bit of history, so pay attention. It's 2007. I'm in high school. Kaltura is an open source video platform. We have a player, we have widgets for uploading video, and we have our legacy management console. 
They're all using a Flex library to access the API. It's 2008, and we add a batch library for all of those things that happen behind the scenes, as well as a PHP 4 library because the back end is in PHP. 2009, we upgrade the PHP library to PHP 5, and it is now used for testing against the API, giving us a very big testing library as well. The community starts to ask for access, so we give them PHP 5.3. 2010, sorry, still 2009, Jonathan, the guy who's writing all of these libraries, decides for a fun learning experience to write a JavaScript library. He says it's awful, but it became the most popular. This is either a testament to his standards or how much developers like JavaScript. 2010, we write a bunch of small PHP 5 Zend libraries uh, used for our media space and CAF, which is our applications framework. It's pretty much media space, but in an iframe. Then the community makes more demands, so we give them Python, Java, and C Sharp. We write a Ruby library for the first uh, cultural media space library, the thing that Omri is working on. Then we write some reference apps, so we write native Objective-C and Android libraries. Comes 2015, we create a node library for server-side ad stitching. Some of you might know what that is. It's just another way for ad tech companies to get over ad blockers. Then 2017 was a very big year for Keltura in terms of client libraries. We created a dynamic test me library, which powers the interface that we use to test and try out the library. This is used externally and internally. And then we created an Ajax library to replace that awful JavaScript library came the time for async, so we wrote all new Node, Java, and mobile libraries with multi-threading support. Then this past year, we replaced that old legacy KMC with the new one, so we wrote an Angular library as well as a TypeScript library because the code is pretty much the same, and it turns out that developers prefer it when they're writing React. And also, why not? Writing libraries sounds like fun, right? Maybe for some. For others, it might seem like pulling teeth. But that's not the big issue here. I want you to imagine this, OK? Developers are the most valuable, expensive resource that we have in the company. They prefer their own languages, their own environments. Maybe they're writing little scripts and tools that help them do their daily jobs. All understandable, right? Now imagine the API breaks and they have to keep fixing that tool. I asked Omri, I said, what's it like using the client library? He said, I don't, know, I don't know life without it. I said, what would you do if you didn't have a client library? He said, I would probably write a little library that has all the calls that I use on a daily basis. I said, okay, what happens when the API changes? He says, I guess I'd keep fixing it indefinitely every time it breaks. Now imagine every time your API changes, now by us this happens pretty often, your developers have to, you know, catch up with the API and fix little scripts that they wrote in order to do whatever it is that they're doing. Or imagine this, you have 20 client libraries, 15 of them are used externally. It's a great system and everyone's happy. You update your API. You need to now change all of those client libraries. Now if this is your development team, sorry, if this is your development team, about 40% of them will be spending their time making changes to all of those 15 client libraries. And we know this because we tried. So what is the solution? What is the solution to having client libraries that will serve both your internal developers and your external developers without wasting everyone's time? What is the solution to making life easier? with updated code and updated documentation. To explain that, we need to go back to 2007 again. Going backwards. It is 2007 and we are about to get into the business of writing a bunch of client libraries. Now we knew, not me, they, knew that the, that the data model would get really complicated with a bunch of objects being thrown around. And so we made some decisions created our own REST standards, decided to only use GET and POST. And then we treated every object in the system as a service and bundled every operation you can perform on that service as an action. And then we created the XML schema. 
complete with objects, classes, and services. And along with that, an XML generator that would automatically create that XML from the API. And then for every language or function, which we wanted a library, we wrote a generator that would parse the XML and create that library. Basically, code that writes code. Who doesn't love that? What it means is that we only need to write the generator once. And with the updated XML in place, the generated library is always using the latest version of the API. I'll show you an example of how you can quickly create a library. Um, some Jenkins, as you can see. I'm going to quickly build a library. Um, I'll s Ooh, that's a problem. You're right. I always make this mistake. Okay. To move it. Just a second. Sorry, guys. Now you can see it. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. So next window. <laughs> now I lost it. That's very tricky, even for me. That's great. But, OK. <laughs> I'm going to do it like this. So I'm going to create a Python library. I'm going to use the latest version of our API. I'm going to copy paste that so I could do that again. Okay. While that's happening, I'm going to show you a little diagram, and I hope I can find it. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. What's happening behind the scenes is that the Python client library generator is reading the XML that was created last night and creating all of the objects needed created all of the objects needed for the Python client library. Now, I'm terrified to go back there. But in this diagram, for example, this is the server logic, the Cultura logo. And right after that is where the introspection happens. So that's where the XML is being generated from the server code, from the API. From there, we generate the client libraries. And CI puts them in GitHub, what we just saw, where they're tested. All libraries that pass are pushed to the public repo where you can access them, as well as relevant package managers for PHP, Ruby, Java, and Python. And the simple yet most important part is that every night a job runs that generates the XML from the code and the client libraries from the XML, which means that developers and anyone using the client libraries are all using the latest and greatest version of the API. And this is all happening in one click, or no click at all. I really want to show you the progress of that library, <laughs> but I don't know how to do that. I would like to display Chrome. OK. So. Do, 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 do. There's my mouse. <laughs> this is our library finish getting created. I go here. I can see all of the libraries that have been created recently. If I hit on latest, I can put it in SAS and. There is my library that I just created. It's 10 minutes off. I know it's super weird. And an hour because it's based in Israel. 
If I download that file, I have a client library that I can use to access the Kaltura API in Python. Now I check the logs. And after the Kaltura Media Space library that generates an average of 294,000 calls per day to the API, in second place we have the Node library with an average of 119,000 calls made to the API per day. And then in third place, the PHP 5 library, which makes 117,000 calls to the API per day on average. The API is made up of 141 services and 758 objects. Jonathan, the guy who writes the client libraries and has been writing them since 2007, says they take about between a week to a month to write. Uh, uh, which is depending on whether he has to write, whether he has to learn a new operating system in order to write the library. He says he's still waiting for someone to come take away the MacBook from his desk. This is actually an open source project that I really want to show you around. Oh, why is this happening? So you can find it here actually. Um, this is an open source project that you can use if you have an XML, which actually looks something like this. I'll show you while we're here. This is our XML. Uh, it's got errors, the plugins, services, classes. This is real. This is our API. It's generated every night. And you can use this library, you can use this project, if you download these three files, to actually do the same thing. You can generate from an XML, create your own client libraries based on the language that you need. Um, uh oh. Now I have to move this here. I'm sorry, this keeps happening, guys. Okay. If you download the project, you end up with three files. This is the abstract class that provides all base helper function for generating. This is the script that tests the client and, and saves the files to disk. And here is the file that you would either change in order to write the generator, or you can extend that abstract class yourself. Now, you can imagine what all these functions do, generate, write project file, write enum, write object class. Obviously, every API is different, and so you change this based on your own API. Now, this might stress you out a little bit, but the good news is that you don't need to do most of this. You don't have to do any of this yourself, because the good news is that really good tools exist nowadays that will automate the whole process for you. Uh, you might have heard of Swagger, that's one of them. What it gives you is an open API spec, which is the standard for visualizing and producing REST APIs. Um, love to go back to my presentation. I think that's it for today. Oh, wow, magic. Um, and with Swagger, there are many different ways that you can produce that open API. There is Swagger Inspector, for example, which will create that whole snapshot by calling your API endpoints, or Swagger Core, which uh, just reads your code and creates that definition. What you end up with is something that looks like this in YAML, or this in JSON. And so whichever method you've chosen, the next step is this. Automatically generate your API client libraries in whichever language you choose with whichever functionality you need given that open API spec that you've defined. Again, Swagger is a really good tool for this. And what you end up with is client libraries using the latest version of your code. Now, it's not always the best approach. As you know, code generators produce generic code, which sometimes lead to poor experiences, which is why we have our XML. But these are decisions that you need to make with your team based on your API, based on what you need. And the truth is the more we, the more we see API as a product, the more powerful these tools are becoming. In fact, we use Swagger for some part of our automation. Remember this diagram? A really cool thing that we do is convert our XML to an open API spec. 
And then LucyBot, which is a project that we sponsor, takes that spec and creates our developer portal, complete with documentation, workflows, and a try it out console, which I want to show you. <laughs> with difficulty, hopefully not. Second. So this is actually used by both internal and external developers. These are our workflows, for example. So I'll show you a good one. Kaltura is actually made up of a lot of operations that have many steps. For example, uploading video. Sometimes I forget what the steps are. Sometimes it's just easy to go through the workflows, even as an internal developer, uh, to remember how things work, to remember which API endpoints we need for each of those operations. So I'm not going to upload a file, but you could see this creates a Kaltura upload token, which you need in order to upload an entry. Uh, this will help you, this selects your file. This then allows you to customize your entry. And then you pair that entry together with the app token, with the with the upload token that we created in the first step. And then behind the scenes, the batch library is uploading that file to your KMC or to Kaltura. Additionally, we have the console. This actually replaced the test me library that I spoke about earlier, which is where we can play with all of the API endpoints. For example, the eSearch API, which was recently added, is pretty complicated. I'm starting to kind of understand it, but this makes it easier to visualize what it is that I need. So, for example, I would like to search for here. Where is my object? <laughs> I guess I have to always use this. And then I use an item. I want to search for an item. As you can see, I have more and more code being added here in Python. I can select any one of the libraries that we have. This is pretty standard for an API console. What's cool about this then is I can copy the code, put it in my code, and you know who loves copy pasting code? Developers. Why? Because. They love when things are easy. They're looking for the path of least resistance. They want to move that task into the done column and go home. So whether you write an XML schema from scratch, or whether it's generated from your API every night, or whether you use an out-of-the-box solution like Swagger, what's important is that you do have a system in place so that all developers using your API have access to the powerful tools and capabilities that make it easier for them to use your code. Because developers who aren't writing your API, be it internal or external, don't need to know about the intricacies of your API. Now let's take it from the top. One, figure out your API. These are the decisions you need to make. Which endpoints will be used heavily? Which client libraries your developers might need? Are there various products and features that are making a lot of calls to the API? Do they have overlapping calls, or does each product need its own library? Will there be processes that take a while and happen behind the scenes? Maybe it's time for a batch library. A testing library is crucial. It might be heavy, it'll take a while to write, but it's a one-time thing that'll save you a lot of time later. Determine the best language to write those libraries. What are your developers' favorites? What is the language of your API? And lastly, but just as importantly, do you have external developers who are using your API? Which languages do they need? Two, based on these decisions, determine the best way to define your API, be it with open API or an XML schema that you wrote yourself, and then define the hell out of your API. Because that is now the consistent source of truth for you and your developers. That frozen shot of your API will help you see design patterns and spot possible flaws. It'll help your developers, especially your new developers, figure out what they're up against and how to help make decisions about the API. And then three, generate those libraries so that you can share your API whether with your own generators or with out-of-the-box generators, so that your developers don't need to write mini-libraries that they need to fix every time 
you make a change to the API so that your developers have access to the latest interactive docs and the latest libraries, making it easier for them to do their job. And then they'll be spending their time and resources on things that matter, because they matter. And then they'll move their tasks to done, and they'll go home, and they'll listen to their favorite 90s albums, and play their favorite video games, or just hang out with their kids. And they'll be happy and well-rested, assuming they don't have kids, and they'll tell all their friends to come work with them. And you'll have more developers writing more awesome products, using awesome client libraries with the latest version of your API. Thank you. My email address, our portal, and if you want to check out the client library generator, uh, feel free to ask me about it later. Thank you. <laughs>